here we are at 11 a.m. after randomizing some more unit strengths. Uh, I had a spill. I got no idea. I think I may have lost a counter on the floor somewhere. I've got to hunt it down. Uh, <laughs> that isn't the fault of anything but my clumsy fingers. Um, and yeah, I have tweezers, but the clipped counters make it hard to maneuver with tweezers. Uh, tweezers worked a lot better with little, little pieces on the end to kind of catch together. And I've made all my counters too smooth, glossy counters, foom, all over the place. There were some big stacks, uh, one of which was the fault. It was the Philly 2-2 uh, brigade, uh, brigade that was all stacked together and just flew everywhere. Um, okay. So, you can see hills pulled back a little further. I want to take a position on the round tops instead of, well, maybe in front of them as well. We'll see what we uh, determine position wise, but uh, for whatever reason, I just felt too unsafe with the Union 3rd uh, Division of the 1st Corps coming close. So I wanted to pull back a little further and I managed that. Uh, some more fire by Longstreet, especially Hood. Uh, drove back some of the Union units. These units are not in good shape. I think I've mentioned that. They're getting pieced by uh, fresh Confederate units here. Let's take a look over here. I had to look up the rules for Cav Charge, something you don't see much in the ACW games. I was in particular interested because here I am marching along in column and feel pretty unsafe for that. But... In 7.4 lists what you can attack and none of the options oh, through the target's rear hex sides oh crap oops so yes I can charge them <laughs> I assumed I couldn't I've moved and now I look and say ah oh, yeah column is all rear I'm not going to undo things if the calf gets a charge off. We'll see what happens. It should be kind of interesting because I believe you still get uh, a defensive fire even if you're in column. The opening fire, if it comes in, that's going to be doubled against charging calf. I am within range, I think. One. So I can light up some of those units. And again, you know, it would have been hard put, uh, I would have been hard put to allow a formation change without an initiative roll. Uh, I think that would have been illegal. And however you want to look at it, I think we're going to see some cav charges, which will be kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> oops feel like parry here. The decision to charge with the calf here is a, kind of a tough one actually because they don't have any great advantage in their charge. Um, their big advantage comes if they're charging artillery or open order which will just destroy the unit. However, <laughs> I'm not going to get a shot in otherwise and that makes for a real question. Um, I'll get to deploy the cav and use them as open order fighters, but they're not, um, they're not, uh, uh sharpshooter capable. <coughs> they're just open order if you flip them over. Oh, not even. Wow. Well, maybe they are tasty then. I know some of them are. These guys over here, I think, are open order, aren't they? Yeah, these guys are open order. So I may be less interested in... Uh... See, the problem with them is they have the carbines. And the carbines are a good weapon. Normally. Um, they're C-type carbines, which have the breech loader advantage. Which gives them just one shift uh, to the right within range two. So if they can get fairly close, they can uh, 
be an effective firepower force. Um, however, I feel like hitting this these forces on the way while they're in column provides me with enough advantages in that they're going to have a lower morale etc. So let's see what we can do with a charge. We still have to succeed in one, two, three, four. Actually, I think I have to bring my leader with me. Alright, I'm going to have to get the leader in the range to begin with. One, two, three. <clears throat> if the leader's not in range, they can't actually undertake the first charge. So, uh, I had to move him separately. I maybe could have slipped some cav up with him. Somebody's going to come up and be in his position at the end. Let's see what do we have here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine... 10, 11 over there, if I can make the check. A 6 is going to make the check. I'm going to need the charts here. <clears throat> Just do this one out for you. Uh, C morale, I needed a 4 or more. I'm attacking, uh, but I'm attacking into a rear hex for the uh, close, that gives me a plus one as well. So we'll try again, because now I have to actually hit. Now I'm not gonna hit Pickett, I'm gonna hit here. Uh, Pickett gives too much of a morale advantage, although killing him is kinda cool. Uh, I don't particularly wanna target the, the leaders with my attack. And I succeed again. Now this was my final 12th movement point. And now we get opening fire. Opening fire is going to be on the charge table. Uh, there's no modifier for being hit in the back. We get a one. That's not sufficient. One or two in charge produces no casualties. So we're big enough we do a casualty. And I'm going to need a little marker for that. So Kemper goes down to a six. And he gets his morale check. Now his morale check, he's strength 6, I'm strength 9. Which means I'm bigger to a plus 2 to his morale. His morale is an A, but he's in column, which means I'm hitting him in the back. So we've got plus 4 to the morale on an A table. This may not break him. Looks like it's going to. It's a nice. Eh. It still gets us a 12 on the A, which is disorganized back three, lose one. So we give him another casualty here, switching him to the five. These aren't bad at all when you've got small oh, forces. And I said back three. That way. And the cav, uh, this had to be facing one. this way to do this, is going in there. Okay, and I'll just keep launching more cav, trying to break this up a little bit. You can see that first round worked pretty well. They may not all work so well. For example, the most likely thing it, it to, for it to fail is on one of those closing rolls. Luckily for me, those closing rolls don't end... Uh, um, with me facing a fire capable unit. The infantry would have to deploy to fire at me, which they probably are going to do if given this situation. That's the net effect. I only managed to hit with two units and only one was, the first one was effective, so. But we may be slowing down Pickett's advance and that, that is of some value while this main attack is going on. Just pinning him down in place may be worthwhile. By the way, you notice the cowardly legs here. These guys are going to have to not stop their advance, and in fact, some of them may have to pull back. This is third division here. Some of them are within close, uh, close arms range or that artillery, for example. These guys, uh, my understanding is on the other side, they're open order. They're open order in both cases. They're not charge capable. 
Uh, so I'm going to have to try to deploy them. And they have orders to deploy on this attack. So we'll take care of that. I'll come back after the end of the Union turn to show what happens. Because we also have uh, the 5th Corps coming into play. But only one division's attacking. I think it's the uh, left flank of the 5th <laughs> Corps that's going to attack. Which will be hitting somewhere down around here probably into Yule's stuff. But that gives the final trigger where 6th Corps can start moving forward. And then as we watch things happen, we can decide whether or not to release, say, 12th Corps, which is perfectly healthy. But unfortunately, it's sitting on Cemetery Hill, the one place I can't give up. Right, well, we got uh, the other Cav deploying itself out here. Um, the main attack that's been happening on kind of the pivot, one thing I've learned is you know, trying to shoot up Hood's troops with the artillery to soften them up, that's not doing me a hell of a lot of good. Better for me to start silencing some of the guns. I still got plenty of guns of my own to fire, but by putting these CBTs on here, it's a lot less likely the Confederates are going to fire. If they do, they might run out of ammo, and then they're done, uh, at least for long-range fire. I have opened up some places like here where we're going to see uh, some canister opening up there. And what is it, 5th Corps? Uh, I dispatched the 3rd Brigade of the 2nd Division to reserve so that they're moving forward. They'll be able to uh, have some impetus and continue moving. Uh, that is the extent of what's attacking there. And I kind of screwed up and took my breastworks with me. So they may not be where they were before. Doesn't matter much. I had that whole command all fucked up in terms of being in the wrong locations. Pardon my uh, colloquialisms. My good old Anglo-Saxon. You know, fuck is not actually Anglo-Saxon. I always thought it was. It's uh, it's Germanic, but from a later era, uh, seems to have come over. What uh, I'm trying to remember when. Uh, I had looked this up. I had been shocked by it, actually, because I wanted to look at the etymology. Somebody made a claim about it uh, that was false. I don't remember what the hell it was, but uh, I, I went and, uh, oh, uh, something to do with, uh, I don't remember what it was. Uh, for snafu, I think. No, no. Fuck for, uh, I don't remember what it was fornicating under something of the king or something like that. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't remember what it was, but they thought it was some sort of acronym that got translated. Actually, in a modern era, there was, which is an urban legend, there was an urban legend from a much earlier period, I think 15th century or so, and then a slightly earlier is where fuck seems to have actually come from. I looked it all up. Please, go ahead and do so. I, it, it was very interesting to me, but like all things in my mind, it slips through. Which is probably my biggest problem with history. I've read tremendous amounts of history over the course of my life, but somehow or another it no longer sticks. Uh, even when I was very young, it stopped sticking. And by very young, I mean in my, my late teens. It just stopped sticking in my head. The only way I remember it is when I reread it. And <laughs> unfortunately, I, largely the history I read was out of uh, library books. But the same thing with all these little facts and factoids that I have in my head, they just all drop away. Anyway. It'll be interesting to see how this hits. Uh, Longstreet's forces, Hood especially, who's taking the brunt of this, they're holding up fairly well, but beginning to show some wear. I mean, they're getting hit by three Union Corps on one division. Uh, that can't be pleasant. Although, of course, there are elements of those corps that aren't really hitting. And we're actually hitting McClaws over here, beginning to strike his stuff. But for the most part, yeah, I mean... It's elements of three core, uh, the major elements hitting Hood's division all at once. That, that can't be pleasant. You know, approach fire gives me so many shots back. I'm beginning to reassess uh, how much I think the attacker has an advantage in this. Um, it would be interesting to do some mathematical analysis on the fire tables between this and the CWB ones as to what actually comes out. I, you know, my guess from looking at the designer's notes is that Dean and crew did that and that it should come out fairly well. Uh, but what I'm seeing 
and I was aware of those when I made my blathering comments before. What I'm saying is, you know what? Good stuff is tough to stop in the attack, and it's tough to overcome in defense. Bad stuff falls apart, and that's very much like CWB. Uh, you start making straggler rolls, etc. Units just start dissolving. Well, here, you don't have all the uh, mechanical aspects to it, but yeah, you know, when good stuff hit lousy stuff, the lousy stuff, like the 11th core, kind of crumbled. Uh, and now we're seeing kind of iffy stuff in the case of the second and third core. It's not bad, but it's not great. Hitting some of the best stuff in the game, which is Longstreet's uh, elite divisions, especially Hood, who just has a tremendously powerful division. Pickett ain't bad either though. I mean, you look, these are almost all A's. There's a B in there and you're thinking, well, that's the lousy unit. <laughs> you know? Pickett was unable to get uh, his initiative writing. Either he or his little brigade commander. They... One roll. I figure Pickett can't really affect the command back here. I'm just fudging making up rolls here as I go. Uh, so he fled from the cab, and that's probably actually the better result for him, is this is a safer place. The only difficulty is if this thing wakes up, it might be charging towards him. I'm not sure. It depends on what its orders are. Over here, these guys lined up uh, to form sort of a defensive barrier. Well, uh, Garnett was able to get his initiative and start deploying his forces. Uh, so he can tr try to like stand there. He doesn't have orders to attack there though. So I, I don't know, you know, he's pretty much held off. Uh, I don't know what to do here because the way initiative is, he can deploy, he can skirmish and probably push forward because these guys are gonna fall back. They're just open order. But I don't feel like he has the right to make an all-out attack, and initiative will not give him the ability to try to push through. And again, you know, maybe I can make up rules as the situation warrants, but I feel like I'm doing that a lot more for this game than I had to over at CWB. Uh, I felt like the rules that I made up in CWB were more, you know, this just doesn't feel right. Well, here... Boy, it doesn't feel right if I'm stopped there, which is what I kind of get. I don't have attack orders. I got the initiative to deploy, but I, I just don't have the right. I don't know if I have the right to get this close, to tell you the truth. Uh, very, very twisted in, in my view. And I feel like uh, these are probably the loosest and laxest rules that Dean has put together. That doesn't necessarily bug me. Anyway. Uh, Confederate artillery, you're going to see we had some uh, grape shot ran out here. Uh, for the most part, I'm still using shell everywhere just because I'm behind the lines. But those lines are going to start seeing some pressure as, uh, as what is it, fifth core starts to hit. And that puts us over to the Union side of the turn. Turns are taking forever now, and that means I play less. Right? Not just that I play less turns, but <laughs> each turn takes so much, it takes so much out of me that I don't want to do another uh, half turn or whatever. So I'm finding myself getting a turn or two done a day, which is where I was before when things got really hefty. This is a tough game to do all by yourself. Um, and so are most monsters, to tell you the truth. <laughs> It's a reason why I stay away from the real monsters. I play some very long things like EU or uh, obviously Empires of the Middle Ages, um, Advanced Third Reich, stuff like that. But when I start getting to these things with a horde of pieces on a big footprint of board, it becomes tough, uh, really tough to play. And this has a lot of density and a lot of fighting in it, unlike, say, Seven Days, which was, for me, a more manageable monster because there were less pieces uh, engaged at any time. It was a smaller battle. Uh, Gettysburg is a huge fucking battle. Plus, I'm doing this on Regimental as opposed to... <laughs> I, you know, I'm much happier with CWB's scale. Uh, I said that from the beginning, and the streamlining on this makes it a little bit better 
RSS was too much. But I think I'm still happier doing uh, doing the CWB scale stuff. Probably should stop buying these, at least for the big battles. The Confederate off-map uh, re reinforcement for artillery is a pain in the butt. However, for the Union, because theirs are on map, they get to use the normal standard Bicasian rule, or uh, I'm sorry, not the Bicasian, but the by battery rules. Which means all I had to do, I have this unit out here, is move it to its legitimate headquarters. And then as long as I can trace some supply line back to the artillery wagon it's going to, I'm allowed to just put this an hour later. And I'll pay for the uh, rounds off of, this is gonna be off the reserve, the uh, army reserve at that point. But it means that I, I, I really am not spending a lot of time shifting artillery back and forth. It is much quicker as long as I've got some trace on the map, I'm good, you know? That means artillery shells are getting through to the headquarters. It just takes longer. I have to go back to the to the Cassians and uh, reload there. But it's not like I have to do what the Confederates had to do, riding all the way out and then riding all the way back. Uh, it's a much, much quicker process. And for them, they had a die roll to add to that to indicate you know, how far more further off the map they had to go to get to the, where they were gonna reload. Uh, so that's kind of a sweet uh, advantage for the Union. It looks like I got another one here. Oh, this one poor Union division attacking all the way over here feels very lonely and very, very out of place. He really wishes the 6th Corps would start moving or the rest of the 5th Corps or something, you know? <laughs> Uh, that's not a pleasant position. He's hitting a very strong position in the line and he's gonna get shot all this shit. There's artillery behind there. He's gonna be able to pick off his rear units. Uh, it's gonna be ugly. And might be able to hit the reserves and thus knock um, his capability. In fact, I think they're in range too. Uh, it, they have view as long as there's not little bits of woods that might be blocking it. We'll see. Um, Over here, though, Hood's finally cracking. We see a number of units falling back. He's going to have trouble holding that line. I, I think he's going to keep falling back, but that puts Hill in a lot of danger if he can't wake up. We might have to fling him back a little further still. Uh, so the Confederate position's looking pretty iffy. I, my gamble here would be that the Union's going to win this one. They're going to clear the road, but... Mm, <laughs> There isn't all that much time left. I mean, this is a lot of turns. Remember, up to here, there's uh, four turns per hour. So, one, two, uh, 30 something turns to clear the road. Uh, just the condition of the Union forces is much, much better than what the Confederates are in. And the Confederate artillery as we can see in places now where the CBT is, but in places we're running out of ammo and there's not a lot I can do about that. There's nowhere I can send those uh, because I got myself cut off from supply basically. I mean, I could trace a line and I could eventually start moving some guns, but right now my feeling is if a gun's out of one type of ammo or the other, it's staying on the field and eh, I'm gonna try to use it as best as I can with just one type rather than try to reload at this point. I guess the most exciting thing that's happening here on Confederate side of 1130 is Pickett slips away himself, although the rest of his command is kind of deploying here, forcing those Cav back. Uh, they're facing guns here. Uh, those Cav are gonna provide a nice little delaying action though for, for the rest of that division. And that that's sufficient, really. Um, elsewhere, well, Hood's kind of rallied a little bit. There was a charge here. Blew through one unit. That was back in the Union turn. And then kind of ran into a wall. This thing was bigger than they expected. It looked like a bunch of crap. And it ended up being some decent sized units in there. So they were able to turn it back. Um, otherwise... I don't know. They look like they're holding right now. The real threat is what happens if this 3rd Division of 1st Corps wakes up and starts plowing into Hill 
or coming around the corner. I don't know what the orders are as the Confederate player. As the Union player, I guess I should, but uh, I think they're actually, I think they're heading up. Uh, nah, they're going to be heading uh, towards the round top, so they'll be hitting hill uh, if they wake up, which is kind of interesting. Either way, they'd be a threat from hell, though, against uh, the Confederate position. And the Union just keeps punching its way further into Hood. He looks like he's pretty much falling apart here. Getting uh, some cutting into McLaws even over here. Meanwhile, poor Fifth Corps still stuck fighting its little fight there. And that third division not doing anything. Holding back. Opportunity awaits it. But uh, things are opening up down here, so other divisions of the First Corps are going to be streaming in and doing whatever ill they plan on doing. And then over here, the Cav is uh, set up, completely deployed uh, to harass the remainder of Pickett's unit that didn't get away. Confederate side of 1145. Complicated situation. First of all, Pickett has moved up and taken a defensive position here. The rest of his force is still back here skirmishing with these Cav. This is a weird situation because legitimately they have to try to get into his uh, command radius, but they can't, you know, ignore their situation to do so. Um, they also can't just attack. They don't have attack orders. So it's kind of a weird situation. Um, this is how I'm handling it. The rules don't terribly lend a lot of uh, help in these kind of circumstances. You do have to make some decisions at times. There's no question there. That'll help stiffen Hood's forces through here. Uh, McLaw is getting uh, strengthened as well. Hill got his initiative, so he's no longer skedaddled. And we'll see all his forces here are now deployed, the guns are facing, and the round tops are going to be a tough thing to take. Um, kind of didn't need both to happen. Picket screening was useful. Eh, Hill was pretty much vital to come back online, but having both helps allows me to extend this forward line here with some of Hill's forces meeting Picket here. Things are kind of scraggly up here. Uh, We'll see, that's probably not going to hold terribly well, and we're just going to have to collapse back to a line back here. Um, over here, though, 5th Corps just got, uh, whatever their division that marched forward, just got decimated. Uh, tons of guns here for the Confederates. And I'm able to, you know, zoom one out here at five hexes this way and others this way. And... Uh, really was able to pick off everything with two ranks of fire coming through. Of course, I'm not sure I actually have those ranks. I don't think I have woods in front of the guns, but it's hot, damn hard to tell. Uh, and that's that's not just these maps. The CWB maps have the same issue. Uh, you know, small, uh, small hexes with pieces that largely fill them. And this kind of terrain, the old S and T, uh, I'm sorry, the old SPI uh, TSR map, uh, I'm sorry, SPI uh, TSS map, it's very late. Uh, I had a nap again, but my brain's not working well because I woke up recently. Uh, the old Terrible Swift Sword map had big blocks of green forest that was very, very clear. Here, sometimes it's hard to see is there a little bit of forest here or not. Uh, again, the amazing thing about the uh, Terrible Swift Sword map is that it's visually appealing given how much it succeeds in giving the, the information it does. How much information does it give? Nowhere near what this map does. Um, I think there's too much information available on this map. Too much precision in making those line of sight calls because nobody in their right mind i think would actually want to calculate all the different lines of sight so when you look at something like big round top 
fucked if I know if anything can see down there. I'm just saying it can't. <laughs> Which is pretty much the situation that you get in in uh, Terrible Swift Sword. You could measure this out, but it's going to screw everything up if one player does and the other player doesn't. Now the troops or the scouts that are going up there can say, hey, that's good terrain. It, it shows a decent amount of the valley. There are some blocked, you know, hex sides, but or some blocked areas where the forests are in your way. It looks like it grows in terrain levels very, very quickly. But, you know, I just can't justify trying to figure it out um, whether or not I can see any particular section there. I don't know. Anyway, um, what else? I guess this was kind of the impressive part here. All right, time to go away for a while and try to rest up for a union turn. Those are the harder ones because they're on the attack and that just means you know, the, the Confederates are going to be pulling back in various places, so less firepower is undertaken. Um, a decent amount, and a lot of counter-flipping in this case. But uh, for the Union terms, because they're pressing everywhere, they're just going to get closer and there's going to be more fires. And there's also going to be approach rolls, which there are, uh, are not, or opening fire rolls, which the Confederates really are pretty much not susceptible to. There may have been a couple of cases. I know I had to fill a gap somewhere. I don't know where though. A whole heck of a lot of combat this turn. It's the end of the 11.45, going into noon uh, with the Confederate side coming up. But... The turn took forever because there was a lot of command and a lot of movement and a lot of messes that I have to try to eradicate, uh, extract myself from. All right, to begin with, Doubleday is still stuck here. Got first core kind of slicing this way, going towards the round tops. That's their orders. Uh, the last little bit of firing here. Third core continuing on. This is a second core unit. The big one that was in front here has pulled back. And the rest of second core is kind of looking a little sparse, although the artillery is mostly pushed Hey, this is one of the problems. I got these woods here. I can't enter them. <laughs> a lot of the units, third core can, but a lot of the second core units that are left are too wrecked. They can't go forward and push the Confederates back. So that's going to cause some, some definite issues. Uh, fifth core, we got. Jeez. I'm supposed to move third division. I don't know if I moved them. Yeah, they moved forward. First division still stuck. Third division, though, took its orders and started moving forward. Brought some cannons with it. I had to bring more cannons up. Um, those are going to be the big telling point towards taking at least the woods line uh, away from the Confederates, for whatever that's worth, because then it becomes hellish. You know, if they defend at the woods line, they can damage me enough, and then they can pull back and I can't attack, which is what happened. You know, somewhat over here, I'm having trouble pushing forward. This is fairly clear terrain, hilly, but I can make my way through it. But when I hit those woods, I'm just afraid, you know, my units are too afraid to move forward. Sixth Corps got moving, and oh boy, what a mess. First Division is stretched across here. It's got to make its way over that way, so I've got to shift it. Third Division is also moving. They're going to take this column. Second Division is not moving. They're the center, so I'm going to be hitting on the two flanks with the center coming up later. I, damned if I know. I've got a reserve for Third Division, I guess. I, pieces were strewn all over the place in weird places. Same with Fifth Corps. Oh. Those guys just were not organized for the attack, and that's causing some problems. Additionally, slowing things up. See, that's one of the things. A lot of the uh, inadvertent issues that I bring up, uh, you know, just through bad play, basically, through some, you know, not paying attention and stuff. Well, those things kind of simulate some of the foot dragging and uh, inability to get your troops together and everything, marching them into the wrong places. You really don't need a lot of scripting or a lot of command failure roles or stuff like that with me in some cases. In some you do. I mean, obviously, look, I play TSS and I get 
over two times the casualties I expect for Gettysburg. I play Thunder and I get, I don't know, maybe 20% greater. I play this and I'm beginning to feel like I'm getting about the right casualty level. But I have no way of telling because there's no count for them. All right. Uh, trying to see if something woke up, but I, I don't know that I didn't mention. Anyway, everything's kind of moving that's supposed to. The turns are just going to take longer and longer and longer. Eventually, we'll see what's going to happen. You know, whether the, whether the rebels lose the road or if they can hold on to a dominating position like this of it. And, you know, if they end up fighting with straggling remains back here or trying to run units around, that's just bullshit, and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to play that way. Um, I think it's too easy for them to deny the Union a victory that way. The veteran Newton side of the turn is up. Oh, it's done. They formed quite a bit of fire on the 6th Corps and a little bit on the 5th as it's approaching. Uh, you know, they kind of broke up the positioning, as you can see, but at some cost. They lost some more ammo here. I don't know how much they were already down. I think they took two losses this turn, though. Uh, they also... Somewhere or another, I have a stack. I think it's this stack. It's filled with both. They're completely out. They don't have canister or shell. Uh, these guys are shot. These guys have ran out of canister some time ago, but they've been sitting right on the line, firing shot. It's a matter of any attempt to try to get ammo at this point is pretty much futile. I may just send these guns back to try. Uh, I doubt that there's enough time for them to make it all the way back up there. Uh, actually, they'd be, they could go to the army. Uh, that's first core stuff anyway. They can go around there. Uh, so it's not quite as far a distance, but they have to make it there and back. That's probably going to get them pretty much... You never know, but there's the risk of the cav intercepting them and wiping them out as well. Uh, over here, the Confederate line is pretty much standing now. Did I? I think I f removed all the... I couldn't have... I was gonna say, I think I removed all the morale markers, but I don't think that's possible. I did it over there, but I don't think I did it here. You, I wouldn't have this kind of line that had all been disorganized. No, I'm pretty sure I didn't have that kind of losses, so these are all in good morale now. One thing you may be noticing is that I formed what essentially amounts to a defense in depth position with the Confederates. What's up with that? That's not really too much of an ACW theory. Well, the idea is I have one thing I really need to defend. I need to defend this roadway um, for whatever reason, because strategically it makes no sense. My supplies are back that way. Uh, yes, maybe I could shift them around, but I don't know. There seem to be Union forces in that direction and Union forces all around the southern side of things. So I can't really move my wagons and such not into a position that my army is supplied either. So it's almost like both forces have to disengage, is my view. And that's the best that I can manage in this case. Um, but why the defense in depth? Well from my World War I knowledge, uh, that is, to me, what seems the most effective at breaking this first attack to the extent where I can't hit a second. Plus, Hill's units are in pretty questionable shape at this point, um, but they're sitting on great terrain. And so basically, that's going to be one hell of a block. Um, but I also, had, right from the beginning, went with kind of a defense in depth type proposition with the idea that if you break through one line, I have the density, uh, you're not going to get through that second line very easily. And it leaves room for retreats and such. Not. So I, I think it should work fairly well here. Uh, we'll see. All right. Uh, end of the 12 o'clock turn. And I'm really struggling with my own being able to play. Just the size of this because everything's in play now the whole scope i still got two more union core i could call <laughs> not all the units are though uh so for example second core we got two divisions out of play 
Uh, over here, one of the third core divisions is pulled out, the one that I've been relying on the most because it's got the better leaders. This other one's been fine in terms of staying in the battle, but the leaders have been having trouble moving forward. Um, I guess that's all that's gotten called out of play. We got the sixth core finally beginning to hit here. Fifth core, I finally started bringing the guns up. I don't know what I was doing with them. Uh, I had them parked back here on the ridge. I still got some of them there. I gotta. I, I figure, and this is again, I'm just making up rules as I go, right? I figure, given the attachment rules that I made uh, for the artillery batteries, it only makes sense that they'd have to kind of accept orders to move but I can make them on the fly with, you know, just park your gun somewhere reasonable. I feel like uh, the game works best if you approach it with that kind of flexibility and you know, a willingness to, you know, tweak with the rules and use initiative for things that maybe isn't clearly defined, but where you can. And you've seen that throughout my play. Anyway, these advances here are not too impressive um, so far. I did actually knock back a couple of units but for the most part, I'm not really engaged too heavily. There's this nasty wall line here, which is really wreaking havoc with the Union's ability to take that location. That's like breastworks. Uh, it's, you know, a shift against them in combat and a shift, assuming I'm not cheating, uh, yeah, it counts as protective terrain, which is the same as breastworks. And it also gives a, a shift for morale checks. So even if, you know, you get kind of like a low end result, like a morale check or even a hit, you're much less likely to do additional damage and force the line. Uh, so that's pretty potent. Um, the rebels are going to get to fire back with the few artillery they have still in with ammo up here. Although these guys are all awake and are going to be firing. However, they've got a whole bunch of Union artillery that parked its way up. One, two, three, four, five. That's as close as it can go. Sixth core threw its guns in. It doesn't have as many as fifth core because remember I, I attach like three of those special artillery battalions to the fifth core. That's the center of my attack. Uh, that's where I really want to bust through. It may not be the wisest place because there's a lot of wooded terrain around here. Of course, there's wooded terrain everywhere. There's kind of a channel here that maybe a lot of artillery could really bust through and get to the road that way. But, well, Fifth Corps could swing some of their guns over here. They've got coverage here. I've got one here. Um, we'll see how I can organize them to best use them. As I drive the Confederates back from here and the guns become less useful, oh, there's a little channel there too. Uh, and there are these nice little uh, shooting galleries that you can form. So these Union guns are here to shoot through this gallery. Hey, just some cool shit like that. If you can see the map, the line of sight uh, and, and, and special uh, terrain situations that, that occur on it are just wonderful. Uh, but if you can't really see the map, it's a pain in the ass. And if you have to start doing uh, calculations over on this table and using the woods and stuff, it's just, <laughs> it's too much of a headache. You know, I just think big round top you shouldn't be able to see off of, so that's good enough. And if that's the case, well then, you probably can't see through any of this other wood stuff <laughs> either, because it's the tallest thing around. Um, I wish Dean had maybe made a, point, a rule of thumb like that for people who are lazy like me. I guess people who are lazy like me will eventually try uh, to see if they can sight and decide, yeah, I don't think I can. Or just house rule it. Anyway, you know, I'm having trouble getting through a turn or two a day at this point because there is just so much going. Meade's beginning to consider giving orders to get 12th Corps moving. I feel like I need more weight coming in here, uh, especially with 2nd Corps kind of breaking apart here, 5th Corps taking its damn sweet time moving. I don't know, but I kind of like to see what these guys can do uh, before I, I, I commit another Corps in there. So we'll see. I kind of neglected what was going on on this whole side because the larger part of my, or latter part of my turn, and perhaps larger, was spent over here. But over here, the first corps began is knocking units back uh, from picket, 
and it looks like ready to just keep pushing. There's no no woods there, so it's fairly easy to fight through it. Here I'm kind of at a roadblock, um, and first course orders are this way, so we're probably going to just bypass that force for some good measure. These New Jersey units, they're not all very good quality. There's you, know, you can see one's good quality, but there's like a D hidden under somewhere. I don't think it made it within one hex. It may be in one of these back hexes here. Um, some, of, some of those units aren't terribly good, so I don't know how well they're going to punch their way through. But hey, you know, I got to put pressure everywhere, and that's where they are. That's where I ordered them. So we'll see what they can do. And of course, the little fight with the cab. The cab. See, the cab is positioned at two hexes because of those carbines. Uh, like sharpshooters, uh, two. He there, there are certain ranges that are good. Two hexes is a good range for the carbines. They can't be at four. The sharpshooters can be at four and are pretty cool at four because they fire on the one chart, even though they're tiny little units. These are bigger units, but they don't work at four. They're they've got a three hex range. But within two, they get a bonus. So I'm kind of sitting here and I'm dueling it out with the infantry because if the infantry moves, it'll chase them away. Uh, but the infantry doesn't really have attack orders, so they don't feel like they can move. All they can do is stand there and, and, and trade shots. Not a whole hell of a lot to report uh, Confederate fire, the artillery back here really do much pounding. Over here we did some definite damage though on sort of that centerpiece of the Union attack is uh, on that corner. Uh, there's a whole lot of fire coming out of here for the Confederates. That's a very powerful position right now. Over here not too impressive again. Over here we'd actually shoot up some of the calf and learn something interesting. I haven't really noted this before but that D chart is a lot worse than the C chart. Uh, bad stuff starts getting really bad really quickly. C is still fairly competent, but anything with D, and I don't think there's anything worse than D at Gettysburg, um, anything with D is in pretty damn bad shape. And once you get into the E's and the F's, you're talking about you know, the totally green units that are just not going to stand up to fire. Uh, it's 12, 15 hits. Uh, it feels like the Union assault is really kind of petering out. Over here, First uh, division of the first corps pulled back, so now it's just one division making the attacks. That pulls out uh, the entire corps is then uh, horde of combat, and we have to uh, look for new orders basically after recovering attack effectiveness and the attack effectiveness. That's not all that likely. I do have a reserve still for the second division. <laughs> the second division's not in great shape. I made that decision with the first division to commit my reserve, but here I may not just to keep the orders present because these guys can pop back in. We saw that happen actually over here with the second corps. And we got kind of a mess uh, going on. Where, what is it? The uh, first division's been in there for a while, but the second division reactivated and pushed in. Over here, third core, half of it is grinding forward. And in some cases, I have some decent units like these New Jersey units, which actually have a chance of closing because they haven't seen a lot of combat. They're not great units. They don't have much of a chance, but that's better than no chance, which is what most of the other units have. Excelsior has also been kind of out of the battle for a large period, so they may, they're coming forward slowly with their great leader who really is the problem here, why they haven't been engaging much. So there may be enough weight here to punch a little harder through here. I don't feel too much uh, uh, confidence in Second Corps being able to push through, but at least they can maintain fire here because there's an opening in the woods. Uh, Fifth Corps, it's just not materializing well. And Sixth Corps, although quite powerful, it has a problem which is this crappy terrain that I'm pulling um, one of the divisions through. The third division, which is flanking the river here, is having a real hard time. 
Second Division hasn't gotten its orders yet. Um, I don't really have enough room to throw another core in yet, but fifth core is looking so weak that I may want to keep tossing the idea around of uh, me throwing orders out for 12th core to go marching in. Of course, if I fail with 12th core and then end up with like 11th on the hill or nothing up on Cemetery Hill, maybe, if 11th doesn't get its orders soon, eh, Yule is powerful. Eh? Longstreet's taken a, a beating so far today, and Hill is pretty much done. But Yule is still a fairly powerful force. That might be able to fight its way back if uh, the attack really fumbles as much as it seems like it. It's kind of doing along here. This kind of piecemeal scattered attacks along the line are just not doing it. 12.30. Uh, the Confederates firing back here. They're showing some serious weakness as well. And I, granted, I'm saying, you know, the Union line is kind of stalling here. Well, up until you start hitting over here where Sems and... Uh, a whole bunch of artillery, and artillery is funny because it's easy to fling out of there and it ain't going to come back if you fling it out. It can reform a line further back or whatever, but it can't sit right on the line like that. You can't set it up there. Um, really everything except Pickett, his one uh, brigade that he's got in play, is very weak and more than that somewhere around here I've got uh, yeah, I've got the Army of Northern Virginia headquarters in danger but that's not a big deal that can I pulled Lee out because of that but somewhere nearby I got a long street kicking around back here uh, there he is and that's problematic because if the Union advance there's not much here he's right up the gap Granted, there's more defensive capabilities in the gap, but it's easier to attack there. Uh, if that goes, all of Longstreet's corps is going to pull back uh, behind the hills and, you know, try to set up another defensive location. But uh, then that puts the pressure back on Hill uh, and also opens up kind of a flank on Ewell that he's going to have to... He's got tons of troops that he can defend it with. Ewell's the most defended of the positions. At the beginning of this, Longstreet had stronger troops, but Ewell has a stronger position with this defense in depth, with a plan to keep falling back. It's going to be pretty damn tough to clear the road uh, in the course of a day, or what's left of the day, but yeah, it's interesting to watch it come out. We're seeing uh, a lot of counter battery fire. Uh, we have more here. Uh, the Confederates are kind of concentrating on that because artillery is so effective on the offensive. Um, it's effective on the defensive too, but on the offensive, the bonus is if you don't charge right up next to the enemy, you can bombard the shit out of them. So I really like this kind of stand at two hexes and use uh, you know local artillery superiority to soften the enemy up. Uh, I don't even have to come charging in, though. I can just stay at that range, not take more opening fire, and trade shots at a pretty good uh, ratio. The problem is, of course, where there's defensive terrain. Like, there's a little wall here that's just uh, being a hellish uh, situation for the Union to overcome, especially since they're coming in piecemeal against it. There's a fair amount going on on the field right now. I skipped the uh, Union turn. I'm kind of sad that I did because Things looked almost as bad for them then as they do now. And they've taken some more losses and been driven back in the center here. Um, it is now, what, 1245 going into the Union side of the turn. Got some Confederate artillery. Trying to figure out its way to get ammo, I guess. Um, okay, so one thing I wanted to bring up, and other than just giving a shot of, you know, that we're not really seeing a lot of difference anywhere is, although the Union has begun attacking a little harder over here on their left flank, is that uh, I'm down to under 30 minutes for a player turn. 
Um, that's about what I, I perhaps wrongly remember uh, from Terrible Swift Sword, I'm not sure. But, you know, I think the big thing is there's not a lot of maneuver now. Everything's, and everything's not really tight, and I'm not really worried about, I've stopped worrying about line of sights, uh, which could eat up, you know, a couple minutes each if I bothered to try to calculate them all. I'm just saying, fuck it, I'll fake it. Um, and, yeah, I, you know, it's just a matter of, it's very smooth and very easy to handle nothing but the firing. It's when you have to start worrying about all the command rolls and um, a number of other factors. When the units get too dense uh, and the retreats are pounding through them and causing chaos that way, it, it slows things down. But right now, things are at this very nice static level where people are engaged everywhere but just firing back and forth, and the expense is not that high. I did not feel this at all, though, on the attacks that happened on the second day over here. That was, those were hour-long player turns for quite some time. Um, but it has kind of loosened up here. Whenever a unit, though, you know, whenever I have to make decisions and start moving units and everything, that it adds to the time factor. Anyway, this is what we got right now. It looks, uh, it looks like really a toss-up whether or not Longstreet's going to break. Um... The biggest flaw is, as I pointed out, Longstreet himself is kicking around somewhere down here and could well fall due to that. Uh, next turn, the Army of Northern Virginia is going to pull its way out of there. It has no effect if it goes, though, which always kind of disturbs me. I feel like there should be something for it. Ah, something I was thinking about. The flaw of the victory conditions, they're what caused this situation. So. If you make Cemetery Hill so bloody important, and it is the game here, but in almost any Gettysburg game it is, it's not necessarily in your best interests as the Union to defend at Cemetery Hill. Defending further forward, even though it's not as good a terrain, uh, serves a very good purpose in the sense that... Um, You have room to fall back. Fallback room's important. Uh, especially if you're kind of stupid with where you put your core headquarters, like I was. And, you know, Hill ended up being thrown back from a position that he could have held for significantly longer uh, had it not been for his headquarters being in a particularly exposed location along the flank where the attack really originated. Um, so what that kind of means is you see alternative tactics and decisions. You know, for the Union, it made perfect sense for me to spread things out. And I think, uh, you know, making that initial, that, that attack that pushed the Confederates out of the, uh, the valley here between the two ridges, or depression or whatever you want to call it, it's not really all that big, um, that's something that was guided by the scenario victory conditions, whereas the reality victory conditions were, this is a good place to try to block the Confederate Army, they will attack us to get through, and we want to cause the most casualties possible. I don't think any tactical game really captures the operational decision of, you know, where to defend on this map. Defending at Cemetery Hill makes perfect sense within operational uh, concepts, but if Cemetery Hill is the goal of the scenario, it may make less sense to defend them. Um, that's, uh, and of course, when you throw in the Tannytown Road piece of the uh, equation, you also get this, okay, um, you, you've got what I think is a way for the Confederates to almost ensure a draw, which is to perform this weird outflank. But there is a cost to it. Not having my artillery resupply. I have a decent amount of ammo left here. 20 shell, 10 
uh, canister over here, a significant amount of canister or shells, a lot more canister. That would all be helpful on the defense. The problem is, of course, it doesn't matter if I'm defending over on Seminary Ridge. The Union ain't coming after me, right? <laughs> Although I think they would, there'd be no reason within the scenario for the Union to attack in that case. And that actually matches, uh, you know, what actually happened is the Union waited here because the Confederates had to force the action. But it's just a matter of, you know what, anytime you try to represent um, a smaller slice of a bigger picture and, and, and present victory conditions that try to, to give that bigger picture's uh, argument, and you're going to fail. So here, yeah, tactically the best ground in the game is Cemetery Hill. Tactically, had the Confederates won and taken, had they taken Cemetery Hill, they could have claimed a victory in the battle. It would have been something of a Pyrrhic victory because the army still wouldn't have any operational use, I think, under, under any reasonable battle that, that would occur here. Um, but the reasons that, cemetery, that you would take the tactical option of defending Cemetery Hill all out isn't because Cemetery Hill is important. It's because it's the place where you're going to cost the rebels the most in order to get through this territory. So in some sense, I don't feel like the normal victory conditions even work. Like, I, I don't think they can even capture uh, what the thoughts are here, right? So Lee's thoughts are, I need to gain control of the territory. For him, Cemetery Hill is important. For the Union, it's not important. So who declares the win? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, when, you, when you set up a competitive game on this kind of circumstance, uh, the victory conditions are going to direct people to do weird uh, things that they wouldn't historically have thought because the competitive nature of the game changes the flavor of what's actually going to happen. Um, what's going through the minds of the players is not what's going through the minds of the commanders. Meade is sitting here saying, I want to hurt the Confederate Army so badly that it can't continue. Or block it by taking a position that it would have to move on and look for a new position, as Grant would in, uh, in, in the later campaigns in the wilderness. So, <laughs> what do you do? And you got the same problem operationally too, although maybe it, it, it doesn't feel quite as, uh, quite as important uh, uh, a dissonance there because usually an operational front you can kind of look at and say, yeah, these are the key places. This guy would, you know, be viewed as uh, a major uh, positive for the overall campaign if he takes Stalingrad and can hold it, right? You know, or whatever. But you're not going to get, you know, you're, you're going to miss out on the strategic decisions on why you want to make that attack there. But the problem with tactical is really you're in this completely... Um, you're, you're playing in a vacuum, and uh, civil war is particularly bad compared to some other eras. For example, the ancients, winning a battle usually meant trashing the enemy army almost completely. Um, it usually gave you a momentum that you could then uh, use to, say, take some cities or whatever. Same thing going up into the, into the early modern era. In the Napoleonic era, too. But here in the Civil War, we're beginning to see this, uh, the, the, the shadows of World War I, where tactical battles don't really matter that much. Uh, you're not knocking the enemy army out and capable yourself of, like, doing great things, usually. Right? Uh, now, this obviously isn't the size of a World War I battle, which would stretch maps and maps and maps and just be filled with troops. The armies, you know, hadn't reached that, that level of uh, resilience and, and uh, uh, the, um, 
the logistics of keeping a huge army in the field across uh, you know a continent aren't there but on the other hand there are some big differences which is uh, the ability of an army to recover from a battle was a, on an approximately a parity between the winner and loser of the battle and I think uh, that's really nicely represented by um, the Victory Games uh, Civil War game. That guy over there. I don't know about some of the others, but in, in the sense that one army hits and both are fatigued, and even if you win the battle, you probably can't really uh, exploit that victory very well. And that captures the feeling uh, that I feel has to be represented here. But then, you know, what you have is, hey, it's Gettysburg, you know, the, the most famous and a fairly matched battle in some ways uh, from the American Civil War. And it's not worth gaming then? What? But it's very, you know, I, I think there's just uh, an impossible task to come up with the victory conditions that match this kind of battle in this war uh, to make a player act as they should. <laughs> because I'll tell you, in games where casualties matter too, uh, as long as the terrain matters at all, I tend to not necessarily defend the terrain that historically was defended, but defend in front of it. Uh, in order to give myself that fallback run. Maybe make the victory point spaces a little behind the important terrain or something like that, but that doesn't make sense either. You know, if the Union got pushed off Cemetery Hill, they would not fight tooth and nail to try to hold the Baltimore Pike uh, over here, you know? <laughs> and if Cemetery Hill is not the option, if it's instead, say, back here, the Confederates would simply go around, right? They were able to in this battle, in, 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 in the game I'm playing. They slipped troops around Wolf's Hill, and they slipped troops around that way, and uh, came completely from the south. It wasn't that tough. Uh, maybe my Union player was not as clever as he should be, but in order to prevent that move, he'd have had to do ahistorical things, like stretch his forces across the creek. So you're just seeing a lot of ways in which the victory conditions have been affecting the play of the game. That doesn't matter if you're just playing for sort of a simulation aspect and you don't worry too much about the victory conditions and you just kind of try to play out history as you see it or play out a particular historical alternative without again worrying about the victory conditions. You know, you could make this outflank and come from the south and see what it does. And it doesn't look like it's really doing much for the Confederates. It's going to win them. It's going to probably get them a draw in this game. But it's not going to get them the territory. And, well, the fact that they're forcing the Union to attack, which the Union wouldn't have to, maybe, if you didn't have these victory conditions, is causing the Union to take a great deal more uh, casualties. And you could ask, well, wait a minute, didn't you say there's an advantage to attack? Yeah, um, like I said earlier uh, in one of the late, more recent videos, I'm kind of withdrawing from that position pretty heavily. Uh, what it is is quality matters. You know, good shit stands, holds the line. Good shit can take the line from bad shit. And bad shit can't handle it. And the Union Army is not the same quality as the Confederate Army in this battle, in this game. Uh, both TSS and Thunder at the Crossroad, I think, rate the Union Army a little better in comparison to the Confederate Army. But that may be necessary to prevent uh, Panzer Group Hill. <laughs> okay. The uh, 1 o'clock turn, we just finished 12.45, that's what I'll label this video. I like to do that for whatever reason. Um, the Union 6th has finally kind of managed a real attack. Basically, getting through this crap has been a pain in the ass. One thing I did was I committed uh, the 316 Division. That means there's no reserve for the 16 anymore. That's going to pull back. Second Division is still snoozing or something. Uh, elsewhere, 
nothing too exciting. I mean, the pressure is still on. One thing, the calf pulled back, and that means uh, the remainder of picket is going to be able to kind of swing around and, and try to avoid. They they stopped their offensive activities, and that that means picket can like resume its movement, I guess. Um, definitely a weakness right here. That's Long Street right there. A big gap leading to him. Nothing I can do about it unless uh, Lee wants to issue some orders. The problem with that is Lee issuing orders. Well, I could skedaddle, but that's the effect that I'm worried about. Lee issuing orders is going to cause problems uh, just because it takes forever for the orders to get there. Oh, <laughs> all I want to do is move the headquarters a little back, but you can't do that. Um, if the headquarters is threatened, you need to uh, you need to actually either issue orders or um, skedaddle. Uh, let me make sure of that. Let's look up initiative, because maybe, because again, this is one of those kind of things that I feel like I would use initiative for in CWB. Hey, I don't like exactly where I am. I want to fall back a little bit without a problem. Um, so general restrictions. Artil move artillery, move an existing order as to router timing, deploy a command during move, release reserve, counterattack, or end a skedaddle. Counterattack to regain terrain. Hmm. So, this is interesting. This can only be done with a reserve, and maybe it's some kind of limitation on the ability to counterattack. So, for example, the situation I had up here on Cemetery Hill earlier where the Confederates had taken the territory. I felt like I had the right to counterattack, but then I kind of felt like there was a point where I wasn't sure that I should have had that right. Uh, I think that would have been this condition, but you have to release an actual reserve to do that. Uh, I don't know, that's a little weird. It may just be a way of, reserve, of releasing a reserve, but I, I don't... I, I haven't left reserves in place when I'm defending because there's no point to them in that case. So yeah, I don't see anything that allows me... Uh, hmm? Shifting force is not directly covered in cases one or two. Uh, shifting defensive forces, but this doesn't mean moving the commander. That's where you're... Uh, using the defensive order, shifting kind of the parameters of the box. So yeah, I, I don't feel like I have the right to try to move Longstreet by uh, initiative or anything. Although, it, to me, it seems like he should have that ability to make a roll to try to reposition uh, falling back defense. This game is really bad on falling back. Um, the old CWB allowed way too much of it. You could basically just withdraw from your enemy continuously. If it required an initiative roll, that would reduce the problem. If that initiative roll, if it failed, caused a skedaddle, you'd almost never want to do it except in this kind of situation where your headquarters is really at risk. Um, so that would be kind of a cool option. I'm not going to add anything like that. I'm going to try to defend that headquarters. But, you know, there's so much you could try to add to the game. It would end up this uncumber... Uh, this encumbered beast, and uh, you know you can't expect that. But to do it kind of on the fly isn't that bad. It's the kind of thing that I did. I don't know when I did my playthrough of. Uh, oh, I don't remember what the fuck it was. A most dangerous time over here. I just kind of made up rules to extend the game. I like to do that a lot of times. You know, I get to the victory and I'm like, well, I still feel like playing. There's still interesting stuff to see. Um, anyway, I guess this one goes up because it's going over time.